God is good, isn't he? Each one of us have been blessed to see a new year. And I thank God for that. Because you know, just like you, I, I read the news, you know, I check the internet, you know, and uh, a whole lot of people didn't make it past December 31st. Some I know, some you know. But we're here in church, first Sabbath of the new year. Amen. I thank God for that. Amen. I thank God. On this first Sabbath, I, I want to I just talk to you a little more about Jesus. Not much. Because quite frankly, it takes all year long to share Amen. what we need to know about Jesus. Yes. But um, we're going to share a little bit on this first Sabbath of the new year. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, eternal God, please, please, come by here, Lord. Please come by here. I thank you. I praise you. I give you all the glory. Let everybody say. Amen. If you go back with me to uh, our opening text, Matthew 16, and verses 13 through 16. It's on the, uh, it's on the screen. And I'll read it in your hearing. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I've entitled this talk that we're going to have, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Just a little more on this first Sabbath of the New Year about Jesus. Jesus, according to this text, and according to this entire passage here, was nearing the closing scenes of his earthly ministry. His desire at this time was to reveal to his disciples the details of his final days on this earth. The final days of his temporary stay with them. He wanted to prepare them for what was going to happen to them. He began his discourse on his coming passion by directing the thoughts of his disciples to himself as the Messiah. He asked the question, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Brother, Christ wanted to know if the multitudes that had and was following him had recognized that it was he whom John the Baptist had preached about. He wanted to know if they were aware that he was the Messiah whose advent was covered by the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. He wanted to know if the multitudes, in their observation of him, his preaching and his miracles had recognized that he was Moses' I am that I am. He wanted to know if they realized, my dear brother, that he was Isaiah's tender plant, his root out of dry ground. He wanted to know if indeed they had believed the report, or for that matter, if his disciples themselves had believed it. It was essential. It was absolutely necessary that his closest disciples recognize him as the Messiah if they could in any way appreciate the meaning of his vicarious sacrifice on Calvary. Now, for, you, for the young people here who may not be familiar with that word, um, vicarious means something done 
on behalf of someone else or in place of someone else. Amen? Amen. If Christ, if Christ were recognized as only a teacher or as one of the ancient prophets raised from the dead, his death could have no more significance than that of any other great man. It would be exemplary, exemplary rather than vicarious. It would have, brethren, no atoning power. Mm. Everybody can say amen. Amen. Those who would find salvation in the cross of Calvary must first recognize that the one who hung upon that vehicle of shame was the Son of God. Amen. The Savior of the world, the Messiah, Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Salvation is to mean anything to us. You need to recognize that. One of the reasons for asking his disciples the first question was to prepare their minds for the next question. What they themselves had come to think of him. Let's look at it in verse 15. King James Version. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? But whom say ye that I am? In the Greek, in the Greek, the emphasis is placed on construction. When you look at this phrase in the Greek, you'll notice that it is, it is the way that it is constructed that gives you the true meaning of what it's saying. So in that language, the, the phrase reads as, but you, but you, who do you say that I am? Now, some of the disciples had been constant companions of Jesus for more than a year. Amen? Amen. And some for more than two years. They had had more than enough opportunity to observe the many evidences of the divinity of Jesus. What did I say? The divinity of Jesus. What did I say? Say it with me, everybody. All right, that's my fault. The divinity of Jesus. They had shared with him. They had slept where he slept, ate what and where he ate. They walked where he walked. They had observed the truth unfolding. They had observed the uh, truth and the unfolding of prophecy in action. And these disciples were blessed to be living in the very presence of Jesus. And what he wanted most was to prepare them for the difficult and perhaps most disappointing chapter in their experience. He was trying to get them ready for what was to come. What was to take, about to take place could crush their hopes and their dreams of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus understood that. And had he not prepared them, had he left them on only part of the story, what was ahead of them could possibly undo all the work that he had put into it. Amen. This is the case with many of us today. We have only part of the story. And sadly, this is the case of the child whose birth was celebrated just a few days ago and whose death and resurrection will be remembered just a few months from now. Many of us have only part of the story. Even sadder is the fact that there seems to be little interest in getting the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is what Jesus was desirous of sharing with those disciples. That story brother, included his death. However, however, if they didn't understand, understand the things that preceded his passion, then they were not prepared to receive the information or answer the question, who do you say that I am? There was so much, brother, so much to learn about the child that was born in that stable and given gifts by strangers who traveled many miles, a great distance, just to meet him. 
They had gotten some of the previews that pointed to his birth, and those strangers wanted the rest of the story. Jesus gave John a look at things to come when he recorded it in the record we refer to as the Revelation of St. John. This was a complete picture with no hidden scenes. I, I told you this, there's not enough time. Perhaps later this year we'll do something, we'll spend some time giving you a little more about Jesus. I'm just giving you a little taste in the time a lot of me here. Now I'm telling you, it's only a page out of the book of endless pages that chronicle the life of the one who gave everything to sinners. Amen. Everybody, everybody didn't get that. I'm telling you, Jesus came to this world to die for sinners. He didn't come to die for righteous people. I shared this with my class this morning. Jesus came to die for sinners. The righteous, their salvation was assured. God sent his son to die for sinners. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, dying, the people that placed him there were murdering him. They had manufactured evidence that was not true. And now here he hung, dying. And as he hung there, he looked up to heaven. I said, Father, forgive them. My murderers! Because they're the ones I'm here to die for. Amen. A whole lot of us, well, I haven't made one yet, but a whole lot of folks, I'm sure, make resolutions for the new year. I was reading on the internet about the top 10 resolutions. You know, they, you know the most popular one? Over 66%. People want to lose weight. And they're going to lose weight. <laughs> I thought the most popular would be, I'm going to get rich this year. But no, most popular is in this country, people want to lose weight this year. And I, have, I don't know how, how true uh, that survey was, but that was the most popular. Then, folks have uh, resolved in their hearts that uh, they want to get out of debt. They want to become financially secure. <laughs> They want to get a new job. And all these things are good. You know all these things are good? Because it, it means that you just want to change your life. You want to do better this year than last year. And that's okay. Amen? Amen. And I'm sharing with you, brethren, resolve in your hearts this year to learn more about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Study his word. Learn more about Jesus. Go with me in your Bibles. Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I want to show you something. I'm, I'm veering off a little bit. I, I promise you this will be a short sermon in an idea, but I'm veering off just a little bit. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Now I want you to listen to me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God has given us a priority. You know that these are Jesus' words, right? If you've got a red letter Bible, you can see that. The red letter means what? Jesus is speaking, right? Yes. So this is, these are Jesus' words. Jesus said, put first things first. The kingdom of God should be first in your desires. Amen. And I will do all the other things, okay? If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus said, I hope you lose that weight this year. I hope you get that new job this year. I'll help you get out of debt this year. I will help you to become financially secure. But first, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That is your priority. So let that be your resolution this year, that you're going to put first things first you're going to study to know more about Jesus. And by his grace, you will determine in your hearts more than ever that in 2014, I want to be saved in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. 
Come unto me. Come unto me. I'm not getting back to the sun. Come unto me, Jesus encourages us. These are words of welcome. An invitation to share in a continuing unfolding drama by Christ himself. Listen. There, there'll be times when things will be difficult. Who knows what I'm talking about? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Nobody goes through difficult times. Things will be difficult. The load will appear too heavy to bear. And yet, come unto me invites us. All you who labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, Ellen White agrees. It's his invitation. She goes on to say that whatever your anxieties or trials, mm -hmm. spread your case before the Lord. Yes. Give it to the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. Mm -hmm. Give it to the Lord and then you can handle it. Yes. You can deal with it. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. Every time I read this, I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the resting in case in casting them upon the burden bearer. I'm going to hand you out this morning, Madeline. Madeline said when we were back here, and she was coming up here, she said, I'm so nervous. I said, Madeline, you do this all the time. She said, yeah, but I'm nervous all the time. <laughs> And I said, Madeline, me too. Every time I come out here, I'm nervous. But I have made it a point to give it to the Lord. Amen. And if it don't work out, it's on Him. Amen. It's not me. Amen. Give it to the Lord. And you'll be braced for the struggle. Amen. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself. Because our page is page 329. Christ has extended an invitation to every one of us to become a disciple. Amen? Amen? Come unto me, he says, the way to true wisdom and rest. He included all of us, those that labor spiritually and are battered by the cares of this life, a whole lot of people, as well as those who carry heavy burdens, the heaviest of which is sin. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Submit yourself to my way of life, for I am meek and gentle. I have nothing but the best intentions for you. He is a gentle, loving, and kind Savior. However, brother, don't take his meekness and gentle spirit as a sign of weakness. Hmm? He is a mighty God. Yes. He's a strong tower. He suffered for you and I. And he continues to minister on our behalf. He is God. He is Emmanuel. He knew then who he was as he is known very early in life. Hey, Chad. Is that Chad Jr.? Hey, man, how are you? I'm calling you out. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm so happy to see you today. Happy New Year. Praise God. Starting the new year off right in church. Amen. I love you, brother. You know that, right? I'm so happy to see you. You can talk to me later about calling you out in church. <laughs> you, you remember a time, the time, when upon returning home from an annual journey to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover, Jesus' parents discovered his absence from the group that they were journeying with. Obviously concerned, they began to retrace their steps to go back, huh? looking for him. And it took them back to Jerusalem. They found the child Jesus in the temple. There, he was speaking with the scholars as well as listening to them and questioning them. 
Finally, upon getting his attention, his, his parents began to discuss with them, with him, no doubt, what they considered irresponsible behavior. It was then, for the first time in public, that Jesus revealed his awareness of his role in the unfolding, continuing drama. He responded to their scolding while reminding them of his role by asking, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? These were the first recorded words of Jesus. And they affirm his deity. Jesus is God. Did you know that I must be about my father's business? This is a pattern of thought that will stay with him throughout his earthly ministry. I'm going somewhere with this. For later he would say to his disciples, how long have I been with you? Do you hear me? Disciples of Christ, do you hear me? How long have I been with you? In other words, you still don't understand my mission. And to Peter, he would declare, get me behind me, Satan, for you are concerned about the things of man and not God. In 2014, resolve in your heart to be more concerned about the things of God. Amen. I think that's where we get in trouble. Do you agree with me? we begin to focus on things of man as opposed to things of God. I don't like to, I know when it comes to God, I don't like to use words like experiment. But I believe in my heart that if we determine this year to focus on the things of God more than the things of man, we're going to find that it's going to be an outstanding year for each of us. An outstanding year. He said to them, did you not know that I would be about my father's business? This year, let's be about our father's business. Amen. And just see where it takes us. Not an experiment. Not an experiment. Let's just focus on the things of God in 2014. Not man. And see where it takes us. Amen. What do you say, huh? What do you Amen. Amen. Let's, let's, let's try it. Can you imagine the conversation between that 12-year-old and the scholars? I can just see him questioning them on the prophecies that pointed to him. I can picture him listening as they expounded upon Isaiah 53. I can imagine him thinking, I am he. I am he with all of your knowledge of scripture. You did not recognize the time of my arrival. I am he. You have eyes to see, yet do not see. I am he. One day. You will say to me, he saved others. Mm. Let us see if he will save himself. Mm. Hey, I am he. You're talking about me. When Jesus comes to you in 2014, please, I'm begging you, be of such a mind that you know it's him. Mm. And if you focus on the things of Christ all year long, when he comes to you, when he's whispering in your ear, when things get difficult, the other thing's going to be all right. Amen. Recognize that it's him. Recognize that it's him. I'm, I'm telling you the truth, brother. I can say this because Brother Grant's been there. Mm. Brother Grant's been there. I learned to focus on Jesus. I learned to, to, to think on the things of Jesus and not the things of Brother Grant, the things of man. Just Jesus. I tell you, my life is better than it's ever been. Better than it's ever been. That's folks that don't like me, yes. It's all right. You know why that's all right? Because I learned that Jesus loves me. Amen. In spite of me, in spite of what I've done, in spite of who I is. Amen. That means the world to me. So my desire now more than ever is to be saved in the kingdom of God. Amen. You see me standing up here, terrified every time I come up here? I'm here because I know that he's with me. I'm here because of our relationship. So I'm not afraid. Amen. I can do this Amen. because he's in me. Amen. And I don't want to do anything else. Amen. This is it. I'm focused. And I'm praying by God's grace. And I hope you're praying with me that I can stay focused. Amen. 
And I'm praying that you will become focused. That 2014 will be the year that you think more on the things of God and on the things of man. Years later, years later, during his earthly ministry, Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, the city of Ituria, which was under the administration of Philip, a brother of Herod Antipas, tetrarch of gov or, or governor of Galilee. Originally, the city was known as Paneas, named after Pan, the Greek god of flocks, pastures, forests, and wildlife, and the patron god of shepherds and hunters. Philip rebuilt the city and named it after Tiberius Caesar and himself. It was there in that city that Jesus asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It is interesting to note, it is interesting to note that the phrase Son of Man designates him as the incarnate Christ. In, incarnate. And in, in young people, that's another word. Incarnate means God in the flesh. And what did I say earlier? Jesus is God. Ellen White declares that this designation, the incarnate Christ, points to the miracle whereby creator and creature were united in one divine person. It testifies to the truth that sons of men may indeed become sons of God. Deity was identified with humanity in order that humanity might be made over again into the divine image of God. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Paul speaks of incarnation as a great mystery in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. To say beyond the bounds of what inspiration has made known is to dwell into mysteries the human mind lacks the capacity to understand. As I said earlier, with the inquiry's mission, Christ hoped to accomplish two things. First, he wanted to find out if through his messages and acts, the people recognized who he was, and second, to see if the disciples themselves had understood who they were keeping company with. Mm -hmm. as, as Christians, brethren, I think we need to understand who we keep in company with. Yes. You, you, you get one another, Brother Grant, saying, mm -hmm. I'm your busy brother here, okay? When we come to church every Sabbath, we come to the house of God. We're basically saying, I'm keeping company with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't have a problem with that. You understand? I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we, under, we need to understand who we're keeping company with. Mm -hmm. Huh? My mama used to look out the door. We lived in the city of Miami. And see me hanging out with some fellas. And she, she called me and she said, I don't want you hanging out with them. I want you hanging out with them. She said, you don't know them. And she was right, because most of the time I lived with my grandmother. And my grandmother lived about 40 miles away. And so when I was there, you know, I just wanted to play with any young kids that were around. And my mother would say, you don't know them. I don't want you hanging out with them. I want you to know who you're keeping company with. If you're keeping company with Jesus, know who you're keeping company with. Huh? Basically what I'm asking is, do you know Jesus? Amen. Do you know Jesus? Amen. I bet you can know more. Mm -hmm. This year, 2014, study about Jesus. Amen. Find out who Jesus is. Amen. Get to know who you're keeping company with. When you do, you'll realize that Jesus expects a certain behavior out of all of us. Jesus expects us to be forgiving. He expects us to be loving. He expects us to be just like him. To say that I'm a Christian means that I am like Jesus. Get to know who you're keeping company with. And I promise you, you'll become the best Christian that you can possibly be. Amen. 
In fact, in the last part of the first question, he revealed to them who he actually was. The question was, in verse 13, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, is? Now, if you omit the Son of Man leaving the I Am, the question remains a proper one. Amen? Amen. Whom do men say I am? However, by adding the phrase Son of Man, Christ revealed to his disciples that he was, in fact, the incarnate one. Therefore, not only asking, but answering the question himself. Again, it was absolutely necessary that the disciples of Christ recognize him as the Messiah before they could in any way appreciate the meaning of his vicarious sacrifice on the cross. It is essential for you and I to recognize who Christ was, but before we can appreciate his atoning sacrifice for each of us, we need to know who Christ was. Make it your business to find out in 2014. And we'll do our best from this pulpit to share it with you. Can I say that, Elder? Is that all right? Can we do that? We'll do our best so, so you will plan. We'll do our best to help you from this pulpit to find out who Christ was, to find out who you can see in company with. Ellen White. Ellen White. She shared that many disciples followed Jesus expected him to take his place on David's throne. Brother Grant's coming to an end. I ain't with him. That was their whole focus. They couldn't see anything but Christ avenging them for the oppression they had suffered. That wasn't Jesus. That wasn't his mission. That, that wasn't his mission. She goes on to say, but when they understood that he had no such intentions, many of them left him. They walked away when they realized that Jesus ain't like that. Many of us do the same thing. We do the very same thing when we realize that Jesus is not what we think he is. We walk away. Like the multitude, they, his immediate disciples, considered Jesus to be a prophet. Not the Messiah, but a prophet. But Peter, bless his soul, from the very beginning, he believed. So speaking for the twelve, he declared that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. By this declaration, Peter was saying to Jesus, you are the one. You are the one. You are the one who Jacob spoke of when he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Amen. You are the one who spoke to Moses at the burning bush, saying, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Amen. You are the one that Hannah spoke of when she prayed, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside me. There is no rock like our God. Yes. You are the one that King Nebuchadnezzar referred to as the fourth man in the fiery furnace. You are the one that Ethan the Israelite refers to as a rock of my salvation. Yes. You are the one that Isaiah referred to as a root out of dry ground. Yes. The revelation of Jesus was, had been unfolding before the disciples' very eyes and they accompanied him throughout his ministries. For us, you and I, who he was and is has been recorded forever. He is God. Amen. He is God. He is God. According to the Gospel of Matthew, he is the promised Savior. Yes. The one for whom God fulfilled the promises he made to the people of the Old Testament. Matthew presents Jesus as a great teacher who has authority to interpret the law and who teaches about his kingdom. When you mention the kingdom of God, you're talking about Jesus' kingdom. In Mark, the gospel of Jesus is the good news. The son of God, a man of action who has power over a demon and the ability to forgive sins. What he wants every Christian to do. And John, John presents Jesus as the eternal word. The promised Savior, the Son of God, who 
came, you became a human being and lived among us. God lived among people. And I am convinced that he does so today. When he told the disciples, I'm going away, but I'm sending you a comforter to be with you always. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who is God. Amen. That's who John presents him as. They all heard it. They saw it. Lived with him and exercised him. All of them could have very well answered the question who he was without fear of being wrong, for they all should have known that he was and is God. The one that hung on that awful tree with the weight of my sins and yours burdening them down. That was God. The one whose blood washes away our sins and redeems us is the same one that Peter referred to as the son of the living God. He's the son of man. He's my savior. He's my redeemer. He is God. Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? Stand with me. Just stand with me just a moment. And let me ask you. Stand with me. Father in heaven, eternal God, blessed Savior, oh, what a mighty God you are. I thank you. I praise you for what you've done for each of us in 2013. But Father, I am looking forward to the testimonies of all of us getting to know you better in 2014. Yes. Of all of us learning, dear Father, and understanding who it is that we're keeping company with. Yeah. I thank you. I praise you. I give you all the glory. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.